that, that uh, he was got diagnosed with after the marriage. So she was so over accomplished and came across as, you know, uh, extremely well spoken, extremely well put together and highly, highly successful. Um, they had a daughter. The daughter was um, um, now uh, in college and uh, had, you know, uh, also was very accomplished in her own right. So when um, Bill heard about Asperger's and suspected that Nancy might be on the spectrum, um, he, you know, decided to um, actually refer her to, uh, to, he actually called A&E probably, and they went and uh, took her to, um, uh, she, they went together to a neuropsych uh, cognitive neurology center here in one of the major, maybe, Boston hospitals. And um, the clinician, who is, you know, very skilled maybe, uh, but maybe not so much in the neurodiverse marriage dynamic, uh, took one look at Nancy and looked at all the scores and the testing and said, hmm, I don't know, it doesn't seem like you're on the spectrum. And, um, you know, Bill was present for part of the, that interview, but, but very uh, a little part of it. Um, and the rest of the focus was on Nancy. And I have a feeling that the clinician was probably very impressed with Nancy and couldn't believe that there was something going on with her neurologically that was different. So um, basically, then Bill, Bill didn't give up. And he kept thinking, you know, oh, maybe that clinician's right, but maybe what if it isn't, maybe, you know. And he kept reading about it and finally found me and came to me. And for me, I think, um, you know, while Nancy presented really well, um, I could tell that there was a major emotional disconnect in, in the marriage that was just above and beyond uh, what is typical. For example, Nancy had an... Um, you know, said to Bill that she loved him or um, or a compliment or anything of that sort uh, for a really long time. And she actually had to be cued by Bill uh, to have this kind of emotional uh, or even communication reciprocity. So even in our session, sometimes she would, um, you know, say something and then it would just, there would be a pause, but there would be no uh, carrying on of the conversation or flow. So there were definitely some real uh, communication challenges. So as you can see, I think it's, uh, it's a really rocky road to diagnosis and um, a lot of people still in, in, in this day and age um, still don't know how to identify the really invisible kind, type of uh, Asperger's that uh, we, we see. So you really want to talk to a clinician specializing in adult Asperger's or autism. I think the vast uh, majority of clinicians are very skilled, especially the neuropsychologists are very skilled with maybe school age children because the whole sort of testing for Asperger's and autism came from diagnosing uh, young children. So for adults, I don't, I, I, at this point, I don't really feel like it's necessary to get a neuropsych evaluation necessarily. I think if that's something that you find that might be uh, of value to look at your own uh, scores in you know, various areas of processing and your uh, intelligence across various um, uh, different categories and IQ scores and things like that, I would say, okay, sure, go for it. But by and large, I think that the you know you want to speak with somebody who really understands um, adult Asperger's that's very like high functioning, where the person is invisible, and also has a lot of experience working with couples, because I think that's where uh, that's the the weak link, so to speak, where um, the adult with the Asperger's can function really well in their jobs, sometimes even be good parents, you know, even the, the in-laws love them. I have spouse after spouse reporting, oh, my parents love my husband. Um, they think he's wonderful or she's wonderful, but, you know, I feel so disconnected and I'm lonely and I'm frustrated um, and, I'm, and I'm really sad. So I think uh, you really want to find uh, a clinician who understands the neurodiverse relationship uh, dynamic, uh, because otherwise you're likely um, to maybe set yourself back, because I think a lot of adults with Asperger's, uh, or any adult for that matter, could be very sensitive to the fact that their partner is trying to pin a label on them, 
So uh, then if you take somebody to a clinician or a specialist and the specialist says, oh, no, you know, uh, he offered you uh, a, um, a tissue when you were crying. I've heard stories like that where the clinician then used that to rule out the Asperger's because they think, oh, well, a person with Asperger's or autism uh, has like zero sympathy, so they wouldn't even know to offer a tissue to their spouse. And that's not true. Uh, so people have a lot of stereotypes and clinicians are not, you know, uh, specifically trained in it either. So when I do a, a, a diagnosis, for example, I use a 13 page life history questionnaire to um, record the individual's extensive life, educational, employment, psychological history and then developmental information and a detailed interview of the client and then a direct experience of a presentation of traits during the diagnostic interview. I do this over four different sessions, preferably on four different days. Um, and uh, an, a key component of that is an interview with the uh, spouse, the non-spectrum spouse. So um, the diagnosis can be important, but sometimes I would say to sum up this part uh, that you don't have to start out with the diagnosis. You can start out with the strategies. But of course, some people really need to know. Then I think it makes sense to really talk to somebody who really understands the neurodiverse relationship dynamic. Um, so what a, a, a diagnosis, once we sort of sort that through that, or we even if it's not a formal diagnosis, if you start viewing, even on your own, if you're reading a lot of materials and books and things like that, if you start viewing your relationship from the Asperger autism framework, that is really, really going to help because otherwise I think both partners can feel um, like they're, um, you know, they're at fault or the partner with the autism can feel like, oh, I can do no right, and why is my partner always angry or frustrated with me? And the non-spectrum partner can also feel uh, completely marginalized and um, not understanding what's going on and just feel really lost and confused, like this has she has no uh, recourse, so to speak. So I think the framework is really important. Um, so the, what, what a understanding the relationship through the Asperger framework, I think, can cause a real paradigm shift in how the um, both partners, actually, but particularly, I think, for the NS partner to see, uh, you know, her relationship and their children, their whole lives and even themselves very um, differently. So I think... Um, so it's and then it becomes, you know, maybe there's less resistance to implement strategies and solutions uh, that actually work, because otherwise I think um, it's it's really hard to kind of feel like you're banging your head against the wall, trying the same old solu uh, solutions or uh, what, you know, conventional wisdom tells you to try and then to see it not, not working. So I think um, that's really, really key. So that's the, the case I was making. She's uh, not a jerk. She's autistic. So um, this is a, an, another sort of story of uh, Stephanie and Carol. Stephanie was a psychologist and Carol was a doctor. And Carol would say and do like really mean things. Carol was the partner on the spectrum. And uh, I'm deliberately not going to identify it in the picture here, like because you can't really tell who's who, and this is not a real picture of these two anyway. As I was saying, these are fictionalized accounts. So um, the other thing is Carol would show her love by doing acts of service, like things like cooking and buying Stephanie stuff, but just didn't know how to emotionally connect with her. And Stephanie had sacrificed a lot for Carol. She had moved to Boston from another state, and here she was feeling, um, you know, like she didn't fit and, and belong, and she was just trying to find her place. And she had lost a whole bunch of her friends and things like that. And um, when they came in to see me, I think um, uh, Stephanie really felt like Carol had a narcissistic personality, 
and there was just a lot of anger and then eventually you know this anger was mirrored by uh carol as well because she felt like you know it doesn't matter how much i um uh, do for stephanie she's never happy so i think um you know even though after the diagnosis it, you know uh think it wasn't an easy road uh and then counseling it, it can also be um difficult through i think sift through all these things and like break up the anger and get these walls down but i think with a lot of counseling and hard work they were able to make progress and um as stephanie once said in a session yeah she's just autistic i always thought oh, she's she's being a joke or whatever and that's not the case so what really seems to help with the couples that i've worked with over and over again is concrete strategies and tools and i think you really need to have these these tangible um uh strategies because otherwise i feel like couples um uh, are you know trying similar things maybe they've gone to couples counselors who don't understand the aspergers and autism piece and and they're trying to um apply the same um maybe uh dynamics of the uh non-spectrum couples uh to the neurodiverse relationship and it doesn't quite work so one of the main um i think to begin with uh one of the main things that i found i think that both couples need is accepting the diagnosis So I think that acceptance is actually uh really hard and not only for the partner with the Asperger's but for both partners. Um so it may seem like oh you know for the non-spectrum partner like uh what is what like she's probably really relieved like okay this is going on but I think that um because the Asperger's is so invisible uh the acceptance of the diagnosis or thinking that your partner has the has Asperger's or is neurological de- different can really i think ebb and flow cuz they could go weeks with where they don't really uh seem autistic in any way or seem um different and you know you could have one inc- incident that happens that then everything sort of falls apart and then there's the autism again you know or the or the disconnect and then for the partner with the aspergers as well i had a, a client once who she had been a member of aene for a number of years attended so many of our groups and things like that and uh, i was an intern at the time and that i was working with her and then uh, she came in one day after months of my working with her and said oh i had a family visit and guess what i really think i'm autistic and i said oh i thought we had already figured that out because she actually had a formal diagnosis so it was just really kind of funny even for her i think she just went through periods where she felt you know like she was not so different and then um something would happen where she'd be in the social setting and then she'd be reminded again okay i am different so accepting the diagnosis is i think key and what can help i think with the, with the diagnosis is really seeing this as a difference and not a disorder um even though that's still in the DSM right now i think we're still kind of behind with looking at things with this diagnostic medical model uh i love this quote and this is from the book neuro tribes by steve silberman i think a lot of you guys are familiar with it i just got an email that it won a major uh, non fiction book award in england i think which is wonderful so what he says is the concept of neurodiversity is based on the idea that neurological differences like autism dyslexia and ADHD are not errors of nature or products of the toxic modern world but the result of natural variations in the human, human genome as we begin to understand how these variations can convey unusual skills and aptitudes we will need to initiate a deep cultural change that recognizes and celebrates a wider range of human intelligence So I think for both partners I mean it can be hard to really think of it um as as a difference I think when partners are struggling so deeply and suffering in their relationship but I think the more we can um uh, destigmatize because I think if the non-spectrum partner sees their partner as um you know uh broken or defective or disordered in any way a i think it puts up walls for the spectrum partner because who wants to be seen that way 
And on the other hand, then the non-spectrum partner might feel kind of discouraged and think, oh, why did I pick such a partner and things like that. So I think it's really important to have that paradigm shift and that complete change in our thinking that we really do need different kinds of intelligences and maybe we wouldn't have modern technology and may not be having this webinar if not for the autism um, brain. So I think that's really an important point. So um, learning and understanding uh, ASD can take a lifetime. So one of the reasons why I enjoy my work so much is that I've never met two people who are alike on the spectrum and there's always so much to know just when I feel like I've uh, l learned, uh, you know, uh, all there was, that the, there's always so much more to, to discover and to learn. So it's, it's just really fantastic. But I think it, a, a person can also change through the lifespan. And, um, you know, even though we're talking about couples, you know, a couple in their 20s and their struggles can be different from a couple in their 40s. So, I mean, and, and then I think learning and constantly understanding ASD and making, I think, uh, accommodations uh, that, that both partners need to make uh, is, is a lifelong process. So uh, we are very fortunate right now. I think uh, there's a movement around this, you know, and there are a lot of papers, articles, books, movies, you know, TV shows um, that are out there now with main uh, leading characters who are on the spectrum. And, and I think it's, it's just wonderful that uh, we're able to, to, to see um, um, and learn um, from maybe different types of uh, case studies, if you will, that are maybe fictionalized accounts, but I think helpful nevertheless. So um, learning is important, but and then also I think uh, for the partner with ASD, um, many times there are a lot of mental health issues. And as I was saying earlier, when they go to a clinician, you know, if you've made it through adulthood and don't have a diagnosis, then I think um, many times for many adults, they may either feel like they themselves have identified that they have anxiety or they may be getting treated for it or, and depression is a big one. So the study after study consistently we see that anxiety and depression are very high amongst uh, people on the spectrum. Uh, so is um, uh, anger issues, uh, maybe some OCD tendencies. Um, I've seen like full-blown comorbid OCD, meaning somebody who had a dual diagnosis of maybe uh, Asperger's um, depression, anxiety, and, and uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, maybe once or twice. But usually it's like OCD types of things, like tendencies. And then ADHD is another big one, just like anxiety and depression. Adults with Asperger's also tend to have executive functioning challenges, organizing time and space and maybe sometimes sustaining attention. And this can always be extreme. Sometimes it's, you know, getting hyper-focused on something. So when these types of challenges are present, I think it's very important that these are identified and then uh, really um, discussed with the clinician, um, the, a therapist that you're working with, and also uh, with somebody who can prescribe medication, such as a psychiatrist, uh, if necessary. Now, the same goes for the non-spectrum partner. Uh, the non-spectrum partner often has their own set of challenges. Um, sometimes this is because they're living with somebody who ha has, is not diagnosed. So they themselves struggle with depression and anxiety, and sometimes they have ADHD. That's maybe a separate diagnosis that they carry. And another uh, thing we call affective deprivation disorder, AFDD. It is not something that is in the DSM currently, uh, but I say just because it's not in the DSM, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So uh, basically, this is um, something that was known as Cassandra syndrome um, uh, formerly, and now it's known as affective deprivation disorder. So basically, the idea is that um, if a partner, uh, the non-spectrum partner, is, has been living with somebody with undiagnosed Asperger's and has not been receiving that um, emotional reciprocity, so emotional food, if you will, 
uh, they do start developing their own mental health issues. And uh, so the affective is the lack of emotion, so emotional deprivation disorder, if you will. Um, so the effects of not having one's emotional needs met um, can have all kinds of really severe uh, repercussions, uh, such as low self-esteem, confusion, feelings of anger, depression, anxiety, feelings of guilt, loss of identity, um, isolation, PTSD type of traits if the partner has maybe uh, anger issues and things like that. So I find that these are most prevalent when the partner with ASD or Asperger's has alexithymia, which is something that's no words for their emotions or have really struggle with emotional reciprocity or expression, or they have a low emotional uh, quotient, so low empathy maybe that, that's emotional, they're unable to maybe struggle with um, intuiting their partner's feelings and emotional states and then um, sort of uh, being able to, um, you know, reach out to them in the moment. So I think that if the, this is present for the partner um, with the Asperger's, I think it's really, um, really important to um, uh, address and to attend to. So uh, there are a variety of therapies, including medications, that can be helpful to both partners. So the main one of, in terms of therapy, I think, is the cognitive behavioral therapy, because um, ASPs can be very much in their heads. So I think we have to go into the mind and sift through the, the thoughts and things that are in there and feel, figure out, well, what's going on and how are those thoughts linked to their emotions and their behavior? And then also, you know, it's not a linear um, kind of circle as well. It's not just thoughts leading to emotions and behaviors, but they could be like uh, concrete strategies that your behaviors also can influence your thoughts and emotions. So taking a walk uh, around a lake, uh, you know, can actually then maybe fill you with, uh, clear your mind, fill you with positive emotions. So behaviors can often also, I think, influence uh, positive um, feelings so, and, and thoughts. So I think uh, CBT can really help. Uh, I use it quite a bit, I, I, uh, but I use it maybe more creatively uh, instead of doing worksheets and things like that. But I really use uh, the, the uh, concepts and, and principles of it uh, to help individuals become more aware of and recognize their negative patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Because often I find that people, uh, maybe both partners actually sometimes, um, don't are, aren't always aware of how uh, they're inadvertently making the situation worse. And CBT, there's actually been a lot of research around this, and I think uh, some of that research includes um, uh, individuals with Asperger's as well. So that's that's a wonderful thing. There's also something called dialectical behavioral therapy. That's a, um, sort of a combination of uh, mindfulness techniques that are very popular right now uh, and, and also very good. Uh, my homework often involves uh, doing mindfulness uh, meditation, and that includes both partners. I recently actually have a couple that came in last week, and um, the non-spectrum partner went on this five-day retreat um, and um, just really enjoyed it and came back just feeling um, like, like she's now less feeling less triggered by her partner. And because she's less angry, now he's less angry and his guard is down and their intimacy has increased because this was a couple that was, you know, physically feeling disconnected because of the emotional disconnect. So I think a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness techniques is uh, really uh, a, a good combination, good strategy. Um, medication. I work with a couple of local psychiatrists um, and um, you know, I actually also work with somebody overseas because I have a couple in another country and they work with their own psychiatrists. I'm able to collaborate um, uh, with uh, really good psychiatrists uh, to, I think, um, 
really understand the Asperger's neurology and also you want to work with somebody who understands Asperger's and also maybe is current on the research about Asperger's and medication. So a lot of the research has shown that low doses of certain types of medications can help um, manage issues such as depression and anxiety. Then there's also, you know, the ADHD, and sometimes maybe it's just a matter of the ADHD med that can um, maybe help um, alleviate a lot of the, the problems. Um, so you never know what, what it is. Sometimes I find that because we have some of the more high-functioning adult profile that I talked about, maybe a lot of those types of folks tend to uh, maybe be... Um, uh, more resistant to medications and things like that. But I had a, a, a woman once in my practice that said, well, I see it as a supplement. You know, my brain is just not making these certain chemicals. And there's research around this, too, because there are certain um, neurotransmitters that I think uh, people on the spectrum um, have, uh, you know, uh, less off or it's a different kind of uh, chemistry. I also feel like a lot of uh, adults on the spectrum have visual thinking and uh, they're very perfectionistic, which as you know, is could be really a useful uh, uh, talent when you're coding or when you're a researcher or when you're a physician or, or a mathematician or a physicist. But that kind of zero defect, perfectionistic thinking, when you um, kind of uh, then divert it to yourself and have these really high unrealistic standards for yourself then can lead to a lot of depression and anxiety and things like that. So I think sometimes if the, the brain just, you know, needs a little boost, then I think medication uh, can help. But I think it's important to have a detailed conversation to speak to somebody who's not just going to throw you on a bunch of meds, you know, and, and to work with somebody you can really trust, and it's a, I think it's a collaborative process, really. Emotional regulation strategies. So for many with ASD, emotions can be very extreme and intense, um, and this is because of neurological differences. Again, uh, there's some research that says, I think it's the amygdala, a part of the brain that's involved in regulating emotions that's a bit larger in adults with ASD. So I think learning skills, so it's not, you know, uh, just the medication. I think, again, it's the CBT, the, the mindfulness, and then I think learning concrete skills and also learning to rate it. I often use uh, rating scales with a lot of my clients for anxiety uh, and and even sometimes for, for anger so that um, maybe they can um, really... Uh, make a choice to not escalate, you know, and to really, uh, and or if they feel like there's a meltdown coming on, then how do you minimize it? And then the mindfulness uh, meditation stuff can really help because you're really understanding yourself, well, what's, what is it that's triggering you and things like that. So otherwise, I think without... Um, learning the mood regulation strategies, I think a relationship can often be flooded with the negative emotions of the um, spectrum partner or the ASPE partner and creates a volatile pattern of reaction interactions, which can over time, I think, destabilize the marriage or the relationship. So um, I say instead of downloading the emotions, the negative emotions onto the non-spectrum partner, or other family members, it's important that the person on the spectrum really learn the appropriate uh, coping skills. So in addition to emotions, many individuals with ASD also have trouble hearing their own volume and tone of voice. So I think really understanding um, um, how to, uh, like if, if, how to modulate, how to become aware of how they're sounding. So they, so sometimes I often say, uh, hear the non-spectrum partner say, oh, you were yelling, and the spectrum partner is going, no, I wasn't. And they just sound like they're not even in the same marriage and like they're married to two different people. So I think really that self-awareness is really, really key. Um, so that's the whole bit about, um, I think, managing the mental health stuff. So um, the other thing that can, I think, really help um, – uh, with mental health and for both partners is the companionship of pets. Um, I 
put this picture on because I love Labradoodles and he, he's particularly cute there. So I think uh, animals such as dogs and cats um, have really proven to reduce anxiety and soothe individuals with ASD. In fact, I have um, uh, a partner with uh, Asperger's who says quite frequently that the, uh, their dog actually adds something extra to their relationship. And I think um, the wife probably agrees as well. So I think that's a, a good uh, option if available. Uh, again, uh, I guess I don't really need to reiterate that, but I think mindfulness meditation for both partners can be really useful to build self-awareness, even for the non-spectrum partner, if she's getting triggered and how she's going down a negative spiral or going, oh, there he goes again, you know, on his sort of logical high horse and getting triggered by that, sort of realizing, okay, well, my partner is not deliberately trying to be a jerk or is a narcissistic or, or what have you. Uh, that's just how they process things. Um, and how do we, um, you know, um, better understand each other so that we don't uh, assume the negative all the time. Uh, and, and maybe we sort of say, hey, wait a minute, maybe this isn't uh, my partner trying to be mean. Um, sometimes some people also like to use, I think, sound meditations like mantra recitations and things to cope with fears and anxiety. So there, there's a lot of those kinds of practices out there. And of course, some people do martial arts and other types of um, exercise as well is another, I think, um, um, key thing for a lot of people on the spectrum. And of course, for people, whether on the spectrum or not on the spectrum, I think in this day and age, uh, the research is really overwhelming, improving the benefits of exercise, um, you know, healthy body, healthy mind, and also um, a lot of people on the spectrum I know actually manage their mental health with exercise because it induces the endorphins or the happy chemicals in the brain. So for those who feel like they don't want to go the route of medications, exercise is a very um, good strategy. Uh, and I think for both partners, because when you feel good about yourself physically, then you're going to feel more confident and relaxed and optimistic about, you know, your life and even the relationship in general. Um, as I said, yoga is also another good way of, I think, forging the mind-body connection. Oftentimes, I find that for people on the spectrum, they're very sort of in their, their head. So it's sort of like I, I do this hand motion that I'm doing right now that you guys can't see, sort of they're operating from sort of like their nose up or their eyes up. So they're just kind of operating from their head, but the whole visceral experience of the body isn't there. So oftentimes I'll ask my clients to uh, sort of breathe and be in their body and feel their feet on the ground and just kind of feel more grounded so that they're not getting carried away, sometimes maybe triggered by the anxiety or triggered by something that their partner might have said, so that they're breathing in, pacing themselves, and really trying to connect with their partner. Um, another important thing, I think, for the partner with Asperger's, and this is important for both partners to understand, is how... Um, you know, transitions, change of an environment, and things like that, I think um, is, is, um, is, is really something that can really affect them. Um, so they could be having, you know, um, a good week, and then all of a sudden, maybe the seasons change. Um, I think we're going through that in, in New England right now. Um, uh, so I think really understanding, well, how does the environment affect a person and and also stress or if you're going on vacation to really prepare ahead of time what the environment's going to be like um, of course you can't always uh, prepare right up to the very uh, last thing but the more you can prepare and um, um, be um, ready for challenges or to kind of uh, understand the environment that you're going um, into I think would be really helpful um, 
Then strategies for ADHD, um, this is a, a kind of a cool, cute little cartoon uh, drawing. Uh, I think I'm sh sharing the presentation with the uh, slides with a colleague of mine, and she said, oh, look, the boss is late. And, um, and then so, that's, uh, so ADHD is present even when people have Asperger's and sometimes people have both or they have maybe ADHD traits or not enough of ADHD to call it ADHD, but maybe they do struggle with some of these things. And sometimes I see that it's extreme. So people who are then hyper-focused also and then maybe also obsessively on time or early or anxiety-driven with the uh, cleanliness and things like that. So again, there's no uh, one type of, you know, um, uh, template or person that I see that you can fit in, in a box. And adults with ADHD are often ignored as well, and that's a lifelong thing. So I think also if the non-spectrum partner, as I mentioned, oftentimes has their own ADHD, so then we need to look at that. If they have ADHD and they're constantly triggering their partner by seeking a lot of information and, oh, let's do this and let's do that. And their partner with Asperger's is getting really triggered by that, taking everything literally, not understanding that the partner with ADHD just has this need for stimulation. And they don't really mean that, oh, yeah, they should just, um, you know, uh, sell everything and, and move to the Bahamas or something. That was just sometimes they were musing out loud or, or what have you because uh, the ADHD mind sometimes have, has this ability to really go into imagination. So I think really understanding both partners' neurology and the ADHD if it's present for one or both partners. Related to that, I think it's really important um, to also have uh, calendars and to-do lists um, to really, I think in this day and age, everybody really needs this, this type of thing. This is like old fashioned, but you know, if you can sync up your Google calendars, um, also, if you have to-do lists and notes and things like that, again, that you can synchronize. Now, a lot of people have apps and things like that. A lot of um, uh, my techie clients uh, love these things, and they're constantly telling me about these new apps and programs and things like that. So I think also scheduling and calendaring and organizing uh, creates a sense of predictability um, I think especially for the partner with the Asperger's and a sense of stability and peace of mind and also, you know, say if something is scheduled on the calendar two weeks down, okay, now they know that they're going to be in a different environment so they can prepare themselves. Oh, I'm going to this big, you know, family reunion and um, that's coming up. So, okay, I got to prepare for that. So once they start preparing and they see it ahead of time and again, the visual learners, a lot of people on the spectrum, so doing the to-do lists and calendars, um, even sometimes as simple as writing something down on an index card, just maybe how the day is going to go can be really, I think, useful. Um, organizing. I recently had um, uh, a couple of people in my practice, but they weren't the husband and wife. It was the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law that came in. And it turns out the mother-in-law actually helps with the organizing because the daughter-in-law, they're a young married couple, she's in school, and so, you know, the, they just could use the extra um, uh, pair of hands helping them. And uh, then I said, well, can we just automate everything and manage the finances through, like, an online program or something? And um, I think they're going to try that out now so that, you know, the mother-in-law doesn't have to be quite so involved. And then organizing space as well for a lot of people on the spectrum, um, they can have a really hard time organizing space. Uh, we once had a workshop here at a &E about hoarding disorder, and that's with good reason because a lot of our adults can uh, qualify for, for the full-blown diagnosis perhaps, but or at least really challenge uh, have challenges with uh, keeping the environments clean. We often have spouses who say, oh, yeah, there are the piles of paper and the piles of this, and they're lined up on the floor, and on the staircase and things like that. So I think if that's the case, um, you know, making sure that uh, the environment is is a, a happy, good, clean, safe one for both partners. And if you need to hire professionals, I think to help you out, we have a lot of professional organizers out there, or, or that can that can help with these things, or or, or uh, house cleaning staff and things like that as well. 
Um, sometimes I also advise that, you know, if the partner with the Asperger's is struggling to find a new job, for example, to work with a career coach or career counselor, because sometimes the part, the non-spectrum partner can feel like, oh, they're, they're their partner and the career counselor and the housekeeper, and they can feel really, really overwhelmed and burnt out. So when uh, available, I think uh, it's good to involve other people that can help. Now, also in terms of finances and things like that, I think a lot of couples, I think they say the number two things that couples fight about is sex and finances. So for finances, I also say if you can involve an accountant or financial consultant, I think that can take away a lot of financial anxiety for a lot of couples. And these are really real issues if they're planning for college and um, things like that for their kids, you know. So, and budgeting, uh, if you have that executive functioning isn't quite there. Um, the other time, the other extreme is sometimes people on the spectrum are extremely good at these things, you know, extremely good at financial matters. So again, everybody is a little bit different, but um, just wanted to say, if you need the extra help, then uh, you want to get that. Developing um, a higher emotional quotient and empathy uh, I get this question a lot, you know, can an ASP develop empathy? And um, so I think David Finch talks about uh, emotional empathy versus cognitive empathy. I think he talked about it in one of his uh, presentations here at a and &E. And uh, in my book, I have exercises to develop more empathy. A lot of it is, I think, getting more um, in your body and your feeling state and slowing down to maybe sync up with your partner. But it's never going to be that the, non, the, the spectrum partner is going to turn into a non-spectrum partner or lose their Asperger's and all of a sudden, uh, you know, intuit what their partner is feeling and thinking. That's probably not going to happen. So I think that um, uh, that's really, I think... Uh, important to develop though I, and I think both partners can use this all of us I think can become learn to be more empathetic in the world at large because if you look around us it's not the most humane uh, worlds out there so I think this is something we can all learn uh, I have something in my book called the sensation emotion awareness practice so it's kind of noticing a sensation a physical sensation that happens in your body and then figuring out what the emotion is around that and then um, figuring out, well, how do you cope with it? If it's a negative emotion or if it's a positive emotion, how do you express that to your partner? I recently also had a couple in where I think um, the, the wife was hurt about a particularly you know, difficult situation in their marriage. And I asked the husband who's on the spectrum, I said, well, did you ever say sorry? And did you ever write a note or a card or anything like that? And he said, no. And I said, well, why don't you take some time and, and write that you're sorry? So he wrote about, I think, three long sentences and took him a few days to do that. But he did. And the wife felt um, so uplifted by that. And I think it really helped their relationship and, and really helped her to move forward and feel like, wow, he really does care. He just doesn't know how to express it. But I feel like practice makes perfect. So the more this person, for example, learns to write down their uh, emotions and feelings and then, you know, express it to their partner, I think the better they'll get in time. And sometimes it may mean, you know, putting it on an agenda or a to-do list and having the accountability of working with a therapist or, you know, uh, to say, okay, well, did you do that? And, and, and kind of uh, coaching you along and cheerleading you on to do that. Uh, the appreciation gratitude exercise, that's another thing. So sometimes I feel like, you know, for a lot of people on the spectrum, they'll say, well, the fake it till you make it doesn't really come to me because uh, it's like I never make it. So I said, okay, that's fine. Even if you don't feel like it's ever going to be that natural for you, I think, you know, having appreciation and gratitude. And now we're having a lot of research that actually if you are, uh, um, are grateful for three things every day and acknowledge that, uh, then it can actually change your brain chemistry. So I think that um, it's really, really um, important to 
deliberately make it a point to appreciate and be grateful for your partner and sometimes it could be maybe the smallest thing and this goes again for both partners because I think when you're having such a hard time in the relationship it's easy to forget the good things or the good parts of each other and why you're really in the relationship so I think um, that's um, really key so um, sensory issues, uh, touch, uh, taste, and sound, etc. So I think uh, touch and sound, uh, I find that maybe are the biggest ones that can cause problems in the relationship. Touch for um, various um, reasons. I think touch can get into major problems uh, in the bedroom. Um, so if a person just has a hard time, um, you know, um, getting sensitized to their partner's touch or they have the startle response or they want to sleep like on their own side of the bed, you know, without any kind of contact with their partner. If the partner is wanting that contact, that can become difficult. Sometimes this can uh, be a more extreme sort of case of a person where light touch feels like a fire running up their body. Uh, I actually had a friend, an Indian friend, I'm from India originally, I was uh, saying to them, oh yeah, some people on the spectrum, it, the, there's a chapter in my book about it, and I think he was reading a little bit about it and said, oh, is it like um, like in Bollywood movies, we have, you know, they sing these songs like, oh, there's a fire in my body and things, and I said, no, not that kind of fire. This is uh, like a real tra tra traumatizing feeling that when somebody touches you lightly, you really feel like there's a fire running up your skin, which can be very traumatizing for the Aspie partner. This is a very, uh, I think, um, difficult uh, situation if, if it's that extreme uh, to sort out. But I think understanding that your partner likes firm touch and finding ways to connect that way, uh, you know, can, get, can be a strategy. Other things can be, you know, uh, using earplugs and wearing sunglasses if the sun like bothers you, you know, avoiding certain perfumes or colognes. I think some I once had a couple where her, she was on the spectrum and he wasn't and all of his um, uh, products, the, the aftershave and all of the cologne and the deodorant really, really bothered her. And he wasn't taking her seriously because, you know, he just teased her about it. But then once they came to me, I was like, no, this is really traumatizing for your wife. Uh, sometimes people are partial to certain types of clothing. And then sound as well. I think maybe um, sometimes uh, it can sound uh, like if you have really sensitivity to sounds, you, like your partner could be speaking in a normal tone and the partner on the spectrum might say, oh, you're yelling, which they're not doing. It's just the sensory sensitivity. So as I said, some of these um, sensitivities, especially I think the touch one, can really um, affect um, uh, people in the bedroom. Also sometimes uh, textures and, and taste and things. I think sometimes partners find, non-spectrum partners find that their partner don't like uh, kissing uh, on the mouth a lot. So that can be also uh, an issue for some people. So I think it's important to talk about it and figure out well, what's at the bottom of this and then what's the compromise. Another issue that we see, I, I actually wrote my uh, master's thesis on this, uh, uh, Bridging Parallel Play uh, with Asperger Marriage. So um, Parallel Play is the title of Tim Page's book. He's an adult on the spectrum. And I think in that he repeatedly talks about how from childhood, he always felt like he was maybe uh, an outsider or never quite fit in or was never able to synchronize with friends or with another person. So what happens a lot of times in the beginning of a relationship, well, it's usually a special interest, um, a special interest that the couple share that may have brought them together during the courtship phase. Now, once they have children and things like that, um, or life changes, this can often take a backseat. So I think uh, then what happens is the non-spectrum partner uh, can feel increasingly isolated because her spectrum partner may not come and initiate uh, a, a kind of reaching for her or filling in the, the gap um, 
that that is created from not spending time with each other uh, or not doing things that are fun. So I think it's important to bridge this gap to regularly schedule activities on the calendar and make it sort of a non-negotiable. So looking at the calendar week ahead, a month ahead, to see well what, what's coming up and what can we do and what can we do with other couples or in community and then how can you talk your partner through that and then what can you do maybe just the two of you. So another concept that is in my book, it's called the relationship schedule. And I feel like just as we, you know, need a schedule, the partner with the Asperger's needs a relationship schedule. Because what I think comes naturally for non-spectrum people, perhaps, and everybody's different again, you know, I want to say that uh, for the partner on the spectrum, this type of stuff doesn't come naturally. So I think, you know, making a chart like this, personalizing it, individualizing it, and uh, for what's meaningful to receive in terms of maybe physical affection or words of affirmation. I often use the Gary Chapman book, The Five Love Languages, to figure out, well, what's your love language and how can you fill this relationship schedule based on that? And it's going to look different for every couple, but there are a few examples of what this can look like. Um, for a person on the spectrum. We recently had a couple, I think Sarah Hendricks and Keith Newton, she was our keynote at the last a &E conference, and she talked about when she first started dating Keith, uh, they're both on the spectrum now, she actually just came out. She said that Keith would just see her on the weekends and then he would go away and then not see her on the weekdays or not text or call or anything. And she said, well, I felt like a whorehouse, a cafe, and a hotel because he would just come and stay with her the whole weekend and um, then she wouldn't hear from him. So she felt sort of quite disconnected and taken advantage of. So she finally told Keith, well, can you just text me every morning and say, hey, how are you? How's your day going? Oh, I'm thinking of you, what have you. And he's an engineer, so I think he didn't want to try it um, at first, but she said, well, just try it, you know, as an experiment. So as somebody who's scientifically oriented, that appealed to him and he tried it. And then at the, the presentation, she asked him well, what happened. And he said, well, um, you, you know, laid off me and uh, didn't give me any grief about um, not uh, staying in touch with you. And the relationship, I think, uh, really improved as a result of that. So sometimes it's, I think, the really small things that you can put on the relationship schedule that can have a big payoff. So I think uh, self-care is really important for the non-spectrum partner. Uh, David Finch, uh, the you know author of the Journal of Best Practices, says a person married to somebody with special needs also has special needs. And I think that's really true. So uh, many uh, non-spectrum spouses report that they rejuvenate themselves by going to beauty spas and other self-care uh, retreats. Um, so I think, you know, I really have to stress that self-care is an important point because otherwise you're going to wear yourself out uh, from being in the neurodiverse relationship and caring for everyone but not for yourself. So I think it's really important to put yourself first. And sometimes it's really hard I think that's probably the biggest challenge making the time, especially if there are children involved and you have full jobs and full lives. I think that can be a challenge, but I think it's worth uh, really uh, trying to prioritize it as best as you can. The other thing is I think also meeting your emotional needs. This is for the non-spectrum partner uh, with friends. Uh, sometimes I want to say even the Spectrum partner has similar needs, but their needs might be different than maybe talking about a video game or anime for hours on end to somebody who shares the same exact interest. Uh, but for the non-Spectrum partner, this could be meeting a lot of the emotional needs for um, sort of being seen, being validated, being understood. I think friendships can be a great source of comfort and assurance. So, and also for the NS partner, I think, uh, so that they don't have to always do things, you know, um, in the spectrum culture or the autism aspect of culture, so, so they can maybe be freer with their friends, you know. So that can be a, a big, I think, um, uh, uh, issue. And I think it's really important uh, that the NS partner 
um, have, you know, also, I think, a time with friends so that they're not spending all their time with their uh, spectrum partner as well. Because also, I think too much spending too much time with each other can be difficult. I also have a couple that uh, is recently retired, and all of a sudden they're spending so much time with each other. And I think it was challenging for both people. And I think the non-spectrum partner there was feeling like she wasn't being able, like for her, he wasn't putting any restrictions on her, her partner wasn't. But I think she felt like, oh, now that we're retired, we're together, you know. But she really had her dreams and aspirations that I really uh, encouraged her to pursue and to, I think, uh, really go for. Uh, managing social situations. So I think a lot of times, in at least um, after maybe realizing that their partner on the spectrum um, uh, doesn't do well with social situations or really struggles or what have you, I think um, a lot of the non-spectrum partners um, kind of uh, start maybe withdrawing themselves socially and not having the parties or hosting events or hosting them and their partner is traveling for business and things like that. But I say, you know, go ahead and, and do it with your partner on the spectrum, but talk about it, figure out, um, you know, uh, how you can actually manage the situation. So maybe the partner on the spectrum just needs a break every so often, um, and maybe they'll be in charge of, you know, building the fire and tending to that. And that way they can go out to get their firewood um, and 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 sort of feel like they have a break or uh, go out and run an errand, but make sure they come back in time or just, you know, take a, a, a mini break. And sometimes it can be as short as five or ten minutes um, um, in sitting quietly in a room or something so that they can then still be a part of the, the occasion or the social situation. Uh, and when ne necessary, I think to disclose as well. Uh, we have an adult here at a and &E who has disclosed to many of his uh, close friends that he is on the spectrum and that at a dinner party, he might just have to go upstairs and, um, you know, uh, take a, a quick nap or something and then come down when he's ready again and his friends understand. And he's so much the better for it. He can go to this dinner party and not avoid it. So I think um, it, that's really key. Also, I think role playing, if that's... Um, uh, necessary or what to say or how to behave. But again, I think it's important that you also have a social circle and friends who are maybe accepting of both partners just the way they are too. Uh, scheduling alone time, I deliberately put this guy here in a dark room because uh, many people on the spectrum say that sometimes just kind of having that sensory deprivation of being in a dark room and, and not having any screens or distractions or, or noise or lights uh, can feel like it's a way for them to really, really, um, I think, um, re recharge and rejuvenate uh, and, 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 and uh, then come back to the family and to the spouse recharged and ready to go. Especially this can be important, I think, to schedule a break between work and home. Um, and sometimes the partner can, you know, uh, bicycle on their way back from home, and that's their alone time. So this looks different for everybody. Sometimes it could be for the partner to come home and just play with their guitar and, um, uh, or, you know, just kind of make music and kind of decompress that way or play with their dog. So everybody's a little bit different. So do what works for you. So communication, I think, you know, this, I think any marriage, any or any relationship, even um, anywhere in the world would say, yeah, like communication, I think we can all do better to work on this and do better at it because uh, we're constantly trying to understand ourselves and each other. So um, I love this. It says, my words came out fine. They were processed incorrectly by your brain. This is often the case with adults on the spectrum. And um, I say this is because the, the individual on the spectrum is neurologically different, that sometimes they're uh, hearing things maybe differently or they're focusing on a particular aspect of what was said. And maybe they're not hearing the whole thing or they're remembering 
of a particular thing that happened in their own sort of way. So then it's encoded in the brain in a certain way. And then, you know, a week later, even when they come to session with me, they'll say, oh, but, you know, um, this is what happened. And I'm saying, wow, are you guys even married to the same person? Because your version of the story sounds so different from the other person. And it's because they encoded it differently. And then now it's outputting differently as well. So I think it's important um, to understand that people process, both partners are processing information differently and misunderstandings over small things can um, become a really commonplace. So I think for the partner with the Asperger's, it's very key to really understand, okay, my brain, it just processes things differently. And to be a little, I think, humble about it and instead of insisting on their own point of view or being right. And I think um, for the partner, for the non-spectrum partner also to understand that, yeah, this person is just processing differently and, and that's what's um, going on here. Because often the non-spectrum partner will say to me, wow, um, am I crazy? I get that a lot. Like, am I crazy? I feel like I'm going crazy. And that's that's not true. It's just that this is the different uh, clash in neurology. So for the partner with ASD, it's also important to learn scripts, phrases, and words to help them speak up for their own needs or to help them speak in real time or to ask for time when they're not able to speak up in real time or to say I'm processing, you know. Uh, I actually had a couple where they actually did this. They wrote on a piece of paper processing, as the spectrum partner did, and he would just kind of hold that up processing. So that was helpful for the spectrum, the non-spectrum partner to realize, okay, well, he's just processing. The other thing is I think it's important that communication be crystal clear uh, and very direct. So I think for the non-spectrum partner, often they're fearful that if they're clear and they're direct um, and they sort of are give instructions or what have you, that their partner on the spectrum is going to be offended by it. But typically, the opposite is true. When it's short, keep it short also, clear, action-oriented, concrete, you know, and direct, it's really helpful, actually, for the partner on the spectrum to understand, well, what to do, how do I behave, uh, what's really going on here, and what's needed. Um, so I think it's really important also to be firm. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, individuals on the spectrum can say, well, um, like if, uh, if their partner makes a particular request, they might say no, and the no can come out for um, maybe something that's new. But the no doesn't really mean a hard no. Many times it means, okay, I don't know about this. Don't bother me right now. I'm confused. Come back to me later. So I think really understanding sometimes that the partner with Asperger's doesn't really mean a no. They just need more time to process. So... Um, um, Joanne here is indicating that we are running out of time. So I'm going to actually quickly move to these slides because I want to keep some time for questions as well. So again, um, information in steps, and I say even for this slide, like step one can be broken down then into A, B, and C. A, B, and C can be broken down into more steps, you know, so sometimes breaking information down and having more detail. So also using email and text, I think, can be really good so that there's no he said, she said, uh, and you can maybe process um, information in this way and, um, um, you know, you have a record of it. So I think um, now switching gears to, I think, uh, as for the specific couples counseling, um, I think a lot of uh, part, uh, you know, people, I, I hear this over and over again still uh, to this day that, yeah, I think, um, um, you know, working with a specialist who understands Asperger's is really key, and especially the neurodiverse relationship dynamic. So because otherwise I hear that working with a counselor that doesn't understand uh, can cause uh, hopefully no harm, but sometimes apparently it does cause that. So I think we have to be careful to find somebody who gets it. So the couples counselor can also, I think, act as an interpreter. Um, just like I was saying, you know, like a no doesn't really mean 
um, a no, for example, it could mean, okay, I don't understand, I need more time to process, or what's going on, or where the breakdown is occurring in the relationship. It can also provide a neutral perspective, like that maybe um, uh, is, is more reflective of the reality rather than the perception of what reality is, and maybe that's for both partners. So I think really working these things out with a specialist, I think, who understands the neurodiverse component is key. So making the couple's counselor the third half of your brain, that's uh, the founder of Google, um, Sergey Brin, who, who says we want to make Google the third half of your brain. I think it's sort of taking over maybe more than half of our brain, quite frankly, uh, let alone third. But I think in the case of the couple's counselor, I think you really want, you know, um, a mix in there so that it's not just the partner with the Asperger's, it's not their own way of thinking and perceiving that they understand their partner's point of view and then their couple's counselors sort of strategies and and to do's and and uh, like bringing a whole different kind of consciousness and awareness to the mix and to the relationship so I think that's really key because I think otherwise the partner especially well both for both partners but especially the partner with the Asperger's can feel like their own version of reality that exists in their brain, that that's how it is, and it's unbending and unchanging. So that's really important. So I think also brainstorming individualized solutions for your relationship, because even some of the solutions I've said here or in the book, they're not going to uniformly apply to everyone, uh, but I've seen them be you know, applied to mo most couples, but of course not in the same way. So I think working with the specialist to individualize the solutions is important. The other thing is each person with ASD is unique. So I think traits manifest differently in each individual. So I often have spouses that can, you know, read David Finch's book and think, well, why can't my partner be like that? Well, because your partner is different. So, and then I think um, coming to support groups often can be really useful to understand like how, um, you know, partners vary from each other as well. And that goes for both partners. Every partner, spectrum or not, has their own, uh, you know, minds and personalities. So models of neurodiverse relationships are unique. Some couples choose to be, live separately or some may... Um, uh, even though they're in a relationship, some may, I think, dedicate themselves to causes, have special interests, you know, uh, giving them uh, a common sort of mission in the world. So it's important to do what works for you and not compare yourself to other non-spectrum relationships or even neurodiverse relationships. So again, community and support groups are important. They provide a form to continue learning to understand well, what uh, strategies are working for others, how do you uh, apply them to, you, to your own situation, so that I th and, and to feel less isolated, especially for the non-spectrum partner. And then for the spectrum um, partner, I think to realize, well, you know, there are other people who struggle with these same exact traits, such as me, and maybe there is something to this Asperger's and autism and the neurological differences. So hope and happiness, I always say that, you know, my hope comes from, I think, the couples that I work with who really surprise me by their resilience and ability to overcome obstacles. Um, so I see, like, they have such persistence and great love uh, in these couples that I see. And uh, for me, it's really humbling and a great source of uh, hope and inspiration to continue to uh, do my work. So I feel... Uh, extremely fortunate. Uh, so thank you all, and uh, I think we can now go to the uh, Q and A's. I'm sorry that we went uh, over time so much. Um, thank you. No so, problem. Thank you, Eva. I could be sitting here all night writing um, right, writing my own notes, <laughs> but we do have quite a few questions, so let's get started. Uh, the first one is about disclosure. How and when do I disclose that I'm on the spectrum to a new partner? Yeah, I think that's a that's a tough one um, to 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 know exactly. Um, this guy John Miller, he wrote a book called Dating Decoded, and this is addressed to worse people on the spectrum. I think he actually addresses this issue in his book. Um, but what he says is, I think to maybe you don't want to do it on the first date. 
um, and you you want to get maybe to a place of feeling a little comfortable and you know um, again whether you're feeling comfortable whether things are progressing enough where you want to disclose it or sometimes I often say to people well if you say to someone that you have Asperger's they may not know what that means or they may jump to some kind of conclusion that you may not want them to so you may want to say for example if after the first date the the part the the person is maybe having going to have an expectation of you calling right away or emailing or texting and that's not your uh, forte that's not your strength and you know that then say well that's something that may not be a strength but don't think that I'm not interested so being very clear so it doesn't have to be that you have Asperger's that you disclose you can disclose some of your traits well I you know and for that I think it's important to understand what your traits are and how they may influence your partner so I think that's a big part of uh, disclosure. Alrighty, so another question talks about what strategies or skills can work for people with comorbid narcissism? Comorbid narcissism, well that's a tough one because I think with any kind of personality disorder, as with say narcissistic personality disorder, I think they have to come to a place of um, wanting the help because even as a therapist and as somebody who specializes in this work, um, you know, I can't go inside somebody's body and make them change or want to change. So I think A, they have to. And the other thing is I, I actually have somebody in my practice who I don't know if I would certainly call him narcissistic myself, but he definitely has that diagnosis from a bunch of other therapists that he's worked with in the past and even the neuropsych. So, you know, he, he probably has some of that going on. But in my work with him, I really focus on the concrete things because people with narcissism can often try to manipulate the situation and try to make things fit for, uh, for how they think. So I think really being strict and saying, well, no, this is how counseling works. And, and sometimes being strict and towing the line, they may say, okay, this is not going to work for me. And then it's not. But for some time, some people, they're really grateful um, to be directed in that way. And they'll say, OK, yeah, let, let's do that. Having the accountability is really useful. So um, uh, tell me what to do and how to proceed. OK, now piggybacking on to that, how do you get the AS spouse to stop blaming and take responsibilities for his own action? when he is unaware and won't listen to reality. Yeah, that again, I think it's really about forging um, um, a good rapport. Uh, now, if you're someone who's a clinician that's asking this question, then I think it's very important to um, form a good relationship. I think having a lot of trust. And also, I think the same goes with, within the marriage as well. I think it ref, is reflective of the quality of the marriage and the quality of the relationship. Oftentimes, for me, I find that, um, you know, if that's going on, then, like, maybe I'm not connecting with the person on the spectrum. So I have to, like, then dig deeper in myself and go, okay, where am I missing this? And how can I connect? And, and then when I'm connecting, I find that they're able to say, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. And that's why I think understanding about Asperger's is really key, because if they're not going, if, if somebody on the spectrum is not feeling understood or how their mind works or how their brain works, they're going to be less likely to um, um, sort of uh, budge from their position, the existing position. So I think it's really important to enter their own world and we'll find out, well, what's really going on, what's the core of their suffering, and why are they suffering that much? All right. Another question revolves uh, making friends and socializing. So how can the non-spectrum partner help the spectrum partner make friends outside of their relationship? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. So I think usually focusing and maybe if there's a special interest or something like that, um, if... Um, you know, they can join a meetup group or maybe take a class or find people that are like-minded 
maybe if around special interests is where I say that's a really key thing because for a lot of people on the spectrum, it's a different culture. Uh, sitting and making small talk and um, you know talking about mundane things is not very fulfilling. So why are they going to do that? They may not be that motivated to do it. Uh, but it may come later, you know, um, finding out about another person's uh, personal life and things like that. But I think really uh, maybe encouraging them to um, even come to A and E groups, or, or, or maybe some of you guys are not in the Boston area. So then finding maybe people who uh, might be exploring the Asperger's question or having common interests, I think. All righty. And now earlier on, you had a slide up where you showed a rating scale and you asked, you said that you use this um, scale and ask patients to rank their anxiety. And it looked almost as though it was an app. Do you have the name of that app? Um, I don't know the name of the app, but I'm sure there are numerous apps out there. Um, that particular image, I think I just pulled from the internet, but I have a, a number of clients who use these apps. But I'm sure you can, you know, with apps, they always have these reviews and ratings. So you can do some research about that or try a bunch. A lot of them are free. So I would say, yeah, I don't have the name for that particular one. And I apologize. All right, and our last question of the night will be, many non-spectrum spouses complain they feel they must be the spectrum partner's mother caretaker, and they thought they had married a partner. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a really tough one. So I think, you know, um, asking the non-spectrum partner, well, what, what are the specific things? What are, what are three things that make you feel like you're the mother and the caretaker? And how can we address these three things? So if one of them, she feels like she's focusing too much on, um, you know, maybe the housework or something, uh, is there a way to maybe hire somebody part-time or have somebody come and help out a little bit for that? Or how to get her partner on the spectrum to maybe, um, you know, schedule an hour on a weekend or something and really help her in that area? So I think this kind of a case, usually uh, this kind of situation occurs when um, sometimes the partner, the non-spectrum partner um, has been maybe shouldering too much of the responsibility. And sometimes that happens. It's a natural thing because of the neurodiverse uh, issue. And then also I think Asperger's can be very pervasive and, and it's, it's just not easy. So I think where and when you can find that maybe your partner can help you in one of those ways. So I think, uh, you know, breaking it down, what are one or two things they can help you, you can hire help, and then go from there. And then you build on that over time. It's, it's not going to be solved um, in a session or, or a week or, um, or, or a month even. It takes long-term, um, you know, planning and strategizing and working through. All right. Well, the, that's all the time we have for tonight. I want to thank you very much for coming in. If you have any more questions, feel free to contact Eva. Her contact information is up on your screen now. Or contact AANE at AANE.org. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.